Welcome, everybody. What a great turnout. I guess you heard that I was moderating. <laughs> They're laughing too hard at that joke. <laughs> okay, so it's my great pleasure uh, to have uh, welcome Steve Blank here to Columbia. Thank you, Murray. Um, as you know, Steve is an eight time uh, serial entrepreneur, started businesses in uh, the semiconductor industry, supercomputers, military intelligence, even a video game, I think, in there somewhere. Uh, then about 10 years ago, he basically retired as an entrepreneur uh, and bought something like, how many acres, 600 acres, something like that, of land just overlooking the Pacific Ocean, just across the hill from Palo Alto. So uh, if you needed any other metric of entrepreneurial success, that's a pretty good one, right? Uh, and then started a new career as an entrepreneurship educator, and I'm going to ask Steve all sorts of questions about that. Uh, uh, started something he called a customer development method and, and really that launched the lean startup uh, movement. Uh, has written a couple of books. Uh, the first book, 2003, Four Steps to the Epiphany. Uh, most recently, last year, a book called The Startup Own Owner's Manual with Bob Dorf, who's sitting over there, his, uh, his partner and partner in crime. Uh, teaches at, at Stanford, teaches at Berkeley, teaches for us here. Uh, his Lean Launchpad uh, method has been adopted by the National Science Foundation for uh, the Innovation Corps. So basically, all around good guy, educator, entrepreneur, and uh, not only that, but uh, grew up here in New York, I think. So I wanted to, we'll, we'll get to all of the boring stuff about entrepreneurship, but uh, why, don't we, why don't we start by um, learning a little bit about your background. Uh, so you were born in New York? I was, at least that's what they tell me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what part of New York? I was uh, uh, born actually in Manhattan in Chelsea and uh, uh, grew up in Queens and uh, my parents were immigrants to the United States. Uh, you know, their big dream after working in uh, sweatshops in the Lower East Side was to uh, own a grocery store. Uh, and they actually opened one up on 8th Avenue and 24th, uh, 8th and 24th Street and uh, ran that for 15 years. And uh, my sister and I, when we were old enough, we'd help in the store. and. It took me 30 years to realize that my parents were small business entrepreneurs as well, and uh, uh, and they, you know, that was their American dream. Is that where you learned your sort of entrepreneurship basics? No, that's where or I learned about pickle barrels and you know how to stock shelves and that work was hard. I've, uh, I'm not sure where I got um, my work ethic, though it was, uh, you know, for most how many children of immigrants are in the room. Uh, not that native-born Americans don't work hard, but children of immigrants uh, uh, tend to have this work ethic of having to, you know, work to live and to survive, and that was just kind of a, a built-in nature of uh, what we did. And I worked full time since I was 14, um, and then uh, when I was in the military, that you know, you didn't have a choice whether you're working or not. So. Uh, uh, I don't know where I got it from. And, and did you go to the military right out of high school, or did you go to college? What no, was I managed to get thrown out of my first university before I joined the military. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, if you were a Jewish New Yorker, you either were going to become an accountant or a doctor when I grew up. And uh, um, I went to the furthest school that would accept me as a pre-med, which was Michigan State University. And uh, uh, I think I uh, got thrown out with possibly the lowest grade point average uh, ever achieved <laughs> in that school. And uh, I hitchhiked uh, down to Miami, had a job loading racehorses on cargo planes, fell in love with not the planes or the pilots, but actually the electronics equipment, and uh, started taking the manuals home to read them. And the, when I asked, how do you get trained to uh, you know, learn this equipment, they said, well, you don't have a shot unless you go to the military. And I went, OK, you know, how do I do that? And the rest was history. So did you ever finish college? No. Yeah, I, the nice part is uh, all my students get a 100% refund if they're unhappy with the fact that they're learning from a professor who got thrown out of two major universities. Because um, when I came back from uh, South the, Southeast Asia during Vietnam, um, I uh, went to University of Michigan as a double E and managed to get almost uh, all the way through before I got thrown out again, and uh, which, which gave me the conclusion that attention deficit disorder and higher education wasn't going to work for at least another 30 years. So you got thrown out. You didn't quit. Well, I think I was given the choice of, uh, of quitting before I got thrown out. But, um, and it was because, and, of, because of poor academic performance? Well, you know, not showing up can kind of cause that. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, 
when I uh, when I now go back to lecture at the University of Michigan because U of M was one of the first National Science Foundation nodes, the Dean of Engineering knows what I'm going to say and his head is in his hand when I always introduce myself as I'm glad to be back at University of Michigan, the best school I was ever thrown out of. And, you know, <laughs> and, and the conversation goes from there. Um, uh, yeah, so I, my career was one of apprenticeship and learning on, on the spot. Um, right, right. And I was uh, uh, what I would consider a pretty slow learner. When I was in high school in New York, um, you know, I, I could barely keep up with what was going on, except for the things I was interested in. And it was my sister who convinced me that you know I wasn't just stupid. I just learned differently, and I did. Mm -hmm. I, I just uh, integrated information in a much different way than the way that our educational system was set up for to do. And I still do. It turns out um, I don't understand something until I could draw it, um, and uh, you know, four steps and a lot of things in the startup owner's manual is about uh, kind of a result of how I learn, which is I'll read a lot of things and I'll integrate them, but until I could go up to a whiteboard and diagram a process and concatenate a ton of data in a simple diagram, um, I don't believe I understood it, which turned out to be what my career was about in Silicon Valley, which was taking uh, immensely technical subjects and being able to uh, make them simply, uh, simple. Any idiot can describe something complex in a complex manner. It just takes some skill and art to take something complex and make right. it uh, uh, in, uh, simplify it in a way your mother would understand it, um, especially if English was still not her first language. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, so you got back from the military, and then yeah. what did you do? I uh, went back to school in Ann Arbor, and then uh, dropped out and became a field engineer for a, my first startup, uh, which was a small 16-person company in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Did process control systems. Uh, took me through the Midwest, and I saw you know, U.S. Uh, manufacturing probably at its peak in the very early 1970s. Since I was working in steel plants and automotive plants and assembly plants, watching the U.S. actually make things. And one of the plants I got sent to uh, was in a town called San Jose. And I still remember our secretary getting the plane tickets for San Jose, Puerto Rico, because no one had ever heard of San Jose, California. And I kind of said, no, I think it's on the mainland. And we had to look at a map. We couldn't even find it. You know, we had to like, you know, get an atlas and, you know, and seriously, I remember this took a day to figure out where San Jose was. Um, and, and this is a true story. We, um, um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1977, um, if, you, if you read the local newspaper, and for those of you who don't remember, those were dead trees with ink on them, with, had information, um, there would be maybe one or two ads a week for engineers. I mean, maybe, and if you'd see that, you'd pass it to all your friends. Um, and, and just to hold that for context, me and another engineer go out to San Jose, beginning of Silicon Valley. I mean, Silicon Valley had been going on for a decade or two, but no one had ever heard of it unless you were deeply into the semiconductor business. And we rent a car to go to our hotel, and as we're driving, we turn on the radio, and we hear an ad. Scientists, engineers, Intel is hiring. Now, this is on the radio. And, and we're coming from a town where you saw one ad a week, and we're going, what? Is this a, you know, is this a joke? And it just patent, that moment passes, and we get into a hotel room. The company was so small, we had to share a room. And, and my uh, the engineer I was with goes, takes the shower, and I happened to buy the local Sunday newspaper. And I couldn't figure out why this little town, San Jose, the Sunday paper was as thick as the old Sunday New York Times. You know, how much news can they have in San Jose? And so I'm peeling through the paper, and I get to the help wanted section. It's 45 pages. It's 45 pages. Now remember, I'm coming from a town where two lines was like considered a busy week. And like I'm going, what? This must be a joke. Where are we? You know, it's engineers and technicians and blah blah blah. And I literally rushed to my friends, take a shower. You know, no, wait till I come out. And you know, he comes out and he's looking at the paper. We can't believe it. And so we're getting ready for dinner and we turn on the television, and there's an ad for more engineers and scientists. And, and this was the difference between an entrepreneur and not. And so what did my partner, the engineer, do? He went to work for the rest of the week. What did I do? I interviewed for a job and never went back. <laughs> um, and so my first job, in fact, after that, this poor little company would never send an engineer out to Silicon Valley without a management person accompanying them because they knew they were never going to get him back. Right. And, and what was the job you took? So I took a job uh, completely by accident, completely by accident. 
Actually, this is another entrepreneurial story. Um, it was with a company called ESL, and I'll explain what it, uh, it stood for Electromagnetic Systems Labs, which will make sense in a second. Um, I entered for the, interviewed for the job. They did something military-like. They wouldn't tell me what it was, but they said my military background was relevant. And it was some lab technician job in an educational group inside this company. And so I flew back to Ann Arbor, packed up my car, drove across the country. It took me you know, a week to drive across in the winter. It was kind of fun. I had never done that. And I get to the company, and I report in. It was probably about three, four hundred people at the time, and I get to HR and they say, oh, the guy who hired you, the, hire, the head of training and education, he was fired and he was never authorized to hire you. You don't have a job. <laughs> and I went, my whole life is in my car. I just moved out from Michigan. And, and, and I'm like, what do you do? Now, this is the entrepreneurial test one, my first day in Silicon Valley. This poor HR woman took, I still remember, you know, felt sorry for me. She said, I said, well, can I talk to somebody that, you know, I'm not leaving. I'm like, I have nowhere to go. Well, why don't you talk to the, you know, the acting managers, the head of the department. He's panicked. They don't need any lab technicians. They need training instructors. Because, like, the, the reason why we fired this training manager is we got six weeks to put together a 10-week course, and he doesn't have an instructor. This was my time. That's my specialty. He That's said. my specialty. <laughs> I met the acting manager, and he said, why are you here? I'm kind of busy. I'm trying to hire a training instructor. And, of course, I said, I'm your guy. And he said, well, you're a lab technician. Oh, no, in the military, I actually taught. And I'm, I could put together a class. And he's looking at me like, what do you really need? I said, listen, I'll do this. Don't worry. And what a, I got my first promotion before I even ended up in the building. I got hired as a training instructor. Um, and now the only problem, of course, is I had no idea how to teach and formally. Um, and one could argue I still don't. But um, um, it, it, it w I had six weeks to put together a 10-week course, which included three 40-foot bands of electronics and six airplanes, and um, I did it and ended up, uh, nine months later, I ended up as manager of the training and education department, and accidentally, I ended up uh, becoming a test engineer and going on site for a couple of these systems, and by very big accident, this company happened to be um, the leading company, for the phrase used at the time, was verifying our, it was our national means of technical verification, which meant it was high-tech spying on the Soviet Union in the middle of the Cold War, and our customers were the CIA, NSA, and National Reconnaissance Office, and I was head of training and education by accident at 23 years old, um, and got to see um, probably the entire spectrum of the U.S. signal intelligence and other efforts against the Soviet Union. And it was incredibly exciting and interesting. And I was teaching both uh, maintenance and operations to a wide variety of customers. Um, and when I was back in um, Silicon Valley, I was living in a house with some other roommates in Palo Alto, just what you do in your 20s. And it was a lot of fun. But my other roommates were working on these crazy, stupid little devices called microprocessors. I mean, they were jokes. They were here. We were throwing more equipment and more hardware than the government couldn't give us enough money to build truly some of the most complex systems ever put together to solve some serious national security problems. And these guys were always saying, look, we can make it make a noise, look. And, and I'm going, no, you don't understand. I got a room full of this. Oh, look at that. It, you know, it can add two numbers in about 20 minutes. And, you know, um, <laughs> and I'm going, what are you talking about? You know, we're, we're getting downlinks from satellites and whatever. And But I realized that at ESL, I was a cog in a massively large national security program, and the odds of me ever being able to affect the outcome or design a program was as close to zero as you were ever going to get. But these other guys, the friends of my friends, they were masters of their own fate. They were starting these things called startups and new companies, and they were doing stupidly simple but fun things. And they drug me this thing called the Homebrew Computer Club, and I went to some of those first meetings, and this was kind of the beginning of you know, Silicon Valley culture. And I made a decision that I never regretted. I got out of the black world and became an entrepreneur. And I found out who was one of the companies making those stupidly simple microprocessors. And it was a startup called Zilog, which was a microprocessor company. And since I was now a training instructor, I interviewed and got hired as a training instructor. And it seems to be my career that everybody gets fired before I show up, because before I showed up, the guy who hired me there got fired, the manager of training and education. 
And literally, you know, 60 days after I started, after they couldn't find a head of manager of training and education, I was now the head of training of ed and education of Intel's main competitor called Zilog, and I was teaching microprocessor design and, you know, assembly language programming and, you know, data communications design. Not that I knew what I was doing, but I faked it pretty well. So that was my mm -hmm. first real commercial job. So, I, so what was your question, Murray? Well, um, um, we'll get there. Uh, so actually, education is, is, uh, is a long history in the Steve Blank career. You know, I never really understood that when I w retired and started teaching again, yeah. that my first career, actually the first six or seven years, was training in education on yeah. highly technical subjects. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I never thought of myself as a semiconductor guy, but uh, of the only companies I did twice was I did two uh, semiconductor microprocessor startups. and. Uh, um, would never have characterized myself as so. That. So it sounds like you worked in multiple startups, yeah. and then at some point you went and did your own startup. Yeah, I think about startup six or seven. I finally figured out it's better to own one than to work. So, so one. tell me about the first one and how you made that decision from basically being part of a team to being like the main guy. Yeah, I think the um, first one I was a founder, a co-founder of, was a video game company called Rocket Science Games, um, which turned out to be uh, one of the largest failures I had ever done in my life. I'll t tell you the punchline. It was, uh, I, lost, uh, I lost $35 million of other people's money just, and I knew I was losing the money the day I was on the cover of Wired magazine. You know, the day Wired comes out, I realize the company is going down. And so there's kind of like, Steve, look at that, isn't that great? And I have to go, yeah, it's just wonderful. Um, and, and one of the funny stories about this, uh, the company was, taught me an enormous, in fact, I've learned more from, I did two craters, that was the largest one out of the eight startups I did. Um, in fact, that crater was so deep, it has its own iridium layer. Um, and um, some of you can explain it to somebody else next to you. Um, um, but. Um, Learning from failure actually happens to be one of the things that I think uh, great entrepreneurs do well. Um, you know, if you're successful, you tend to think it's all about you. Um, but um, okay, when you so, what, what did you learn from that failure? Uh, a couple of heuristics that um, I still teach. One is um, you're in real trouble if you realize you hate your customers. Um, and I don't mean that facetiously. My whole career up to that, I had taught or, or it, uh, not taught, but sold to scientists, engineers, et cetera. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Here in a video game company, my customers were teenage adolescent boys, um, you know, who wanted to kill something, um, you know, in a video game. And I realized after a while, I didn't actually like those customers. And mm -hmm. when they're a lot less fun than the PhDs I was selling supercomputers to in my last company. Um, so that's, that's characteristic one, uh, or, or failure mode one. Failure mode two, um, and I've seen this a lot and I counsel a lot of successful entrepreneurs, is hubris will kill you. Um, by hubris, you know, I had come off a fairly successful track record into this startup. I was able to raise all this money based on that track record. And gee, I was on the cover of Wired and Fortune and whatever. And, you know, hey, look, look at my press. I must be a genius. It says so here. Um, rather than, am I delivering anything valuable to a series of customers? And uh, um, boy, that really kills you. And it kills you personally because you know, it was all about you. And then third is, uh, which is a lot about what I teach, is um, you fall into the trap of believing that, well, because I believe, therefore, we ought to build it, rather than perhaps we ought to ask somebody else. And that wraps up into your hubris in believing that, well, you don't need anybody else's opinion. Yours is good enough. Um, and and that, uh, that failure was probably the first time in 21 years, and the last time in 21 years, um, I hated going into work for three weeks. Um, that was my entire career. Uh, that was the only time I, I like dreaded going in until I managed to sell the company and, you know, for piece parts before, before it, it was going to run out of money. Hmm. Um, the irony is, of course, uh, I called up my mother after uh, I lost $35 million and said, Mom, you know, lost $35 million. Um, and uh, my mother, as I mentioned, was an immigrant. English was not her first language. Um, you know, she like had to process that for a while, and and because she wasn't processing it exactly, she said, "Well, you lost it. Where'd you put it?" 
<laughs> and and I, I was a little taken aback. And I said, no, 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 Mom, lost it as like spent it, all gone. You know, like I used some Yiddish or Russian words, and you know, she finally got the concept. And then she said, oh, we can't leave. Our name is already blank. There's no one for no place for us to go. The country doesn't even exist anymore where we came from. And you know, <laughs> blah blah blah. I said, no, no, Mom. The reason why I'm calling you is the same people who gave me the thirty-five million dollars just gave me another $12 million. <laughs> so a lot, a lot happened in that three weeks. It, it yeah. was, um, well, um, you know, one of the interesting things about Silicon Valley and about any entrepreneurial cluster, New York as well, we have a special word for failed entrepreneur. Special word. Anybody know the word? Somebody just said it. For a failed entrepreneur, what's that word? Experienced. It's a huge concept. People from foreign countries, have a hard time processing because it's a, it's a characteristic only that exists in entrepreneurial clusters. You get multiple shots at the goal for a, for a honest failure. You know, after about four or five, you're not going to get funded again. But, but you do not have to change your name. You do not spend five or 12 years in bankruptcy court like you would in Chile. Um, you know, investors will, will talk to you again. And the punchline is, and why I'm sitting here rather than there, is that out of that $12 million, I returned a billion dollars each to the two VCs who gave it to me, um, which kind of now perpetuated the myth of, yes, perhaps we ought to give um, zero entrepreneurs uh, another shot at the goal. It was a massive failure. It was a public failure. It was, you know, cover of everything. Um, but, you know, after those three weeks, I stopped sleeping during the day and got undepressed and just went at it again. And... Uh, um, and in between there were, uh, as I said, I did eight startups in 21 years. Right. So um, having self-confidence and not blaming yourself when bad things happen. Oh, no, uh, I blamed my. In fact, the win, Murray, was when I was able to blame myself. The, you know, the first level of blame was, who can I blame? Um, you know, it was my VC's fault, and it was my co-founder's fault, and I'll still blame him a bit. But at the end, uh, <laughs> but at the end if you don't own it, um, you're not done. And, mm -hmm. and if you, so when I interview failed entrepreneurs, the, the first thing I want to hear is, how'd you screw it up? And if they can't tell me that, then they're not done in the learning process. How did they screw up? Yeah, how did they and screw what did, up? What part of it did they what own? What part did they own? And by the way, if you're CEO, you owned all of it. Um, I don't care if other people made the mistakes. At the end of the day, you were in charge. Which, by the way, just as an aside, and there was a little of this there, uh, some of you will encounter one day, uh, how many of you are doing a startup with a board of directors? Okay. Uh, someday you will encounter working at a startup where your board insists that you do X and you believe you should be doing Y. What do you think the right answer is? Okay. Right. And you would think, you know, well, follow your board's direction. They're your boss. I got to tell you, it's over that day you do. If you, in fact, are no longer managing your company, you're going to get fired either way. So you might as well explain to the board, no, this is what I'm going to do. Your job is to either fire me or go along with this, but this is why I believe this. If all of a sudden you start managing the company because you're doing what they're told you to do, you're no longer managing the company. They're managing the company. And there was a part of that as well. I mean, in me listening to all these the separate voices, I stopped listening to mine. Um, and one of the one of the things you're supposed to do as an entrepreneur is, while you want to get a ton of data in, um, if you don't have profound beliefs, you're just simply going to be whipsawed uh, by the last person to talk to you. Um, that was one of the many things I learned. But, the, but on the top, I just wanted to get to know I needed to own it first mm -hmm. and understand that it was my failure. And then, then I could get on with, well, I'm not going to screw that up again. You know, what are the things I could learn and go do? And boy, we nailed it in the next one. Everything I screwed up, we kind of like just put in place and got right. So, so tell us about the, the business that was $12 million that returned $2 billion. Yeah, Actually, we returned a lot more than that. But um, <laughs> Wall Street got the rest of it. Um, um, it was an enterprise software company, which had, like every startup I, I did, I had no idea what enterprise software was. When my co-founder uh, came in and said, why don't we automate you know, something in the enterprise? And I, it, it was somebody I had done two other companies with. and. I thought it was the craziest idea I'd ever heard. So I threw him out of my house. And I said, ah, oh, Ben, I don't know anything about enterprise software. And much like all the good ideas this guy had in 25 years, 
you know, I thought about it for a week and went, oh, that is a good idea, and called him back, and we started brainstorming, and he wanted me to figure out how to enterprise the marketing department, because he said, Steve, you're the best marketeer I know, blah, 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 let's go figure out how to do this. No one had automated corporate marketing in, in, in the enterprise. This was in the mid-90s. Um, and we started figuring out how to build a, build a company and do this, and um, um, we just spent a lot of time outside the building, which, as I said, we didn't do. In fact, the beginning of the whole lean startup and customer development um, process started at a, this company was called Epiphany, um, uh, for all the right reasons. It was, you know, a sudden flash of insight, and that's what actually started the company. But um, talking to infinite number of CIOs and um, operating execs, we actually, uh, by the time we shipped our product, we knew exactly what we were building for who. And it wasn't just my opinion, it was actually based on the fact that we had tons of advisors and people helping us um, outside the building. Have you always had, because I noticed you mentioned the two businesses, the rocket science mm -hmm. uh, games mm -hmm. and Epiphany, uh, that you had a co-founder. Do you like having a, uh, am I correct in that? And do you like having a partner? I, I, personally, I don't know how to do, I, I'm, if anybody's doing a startup by yourself, congratulations. I have no idea how you end up talking to yourself. Um, I just don't get it. Um, you know, startups are, a, to me, a team-based environment. They're very rare case. I can't think of any um, where you hit it out of the park. I mean, you might just hear about one co one founder, but it's usually a founding team. You know, usually there's one Mr. Outside or Ms. Outside and one uh, Ms. Inside. Uh, but um, you know, is it an equal partnership? Well, it's, it always starts out as one, but it never is. Um, you know, think about Wozniak and Jobs. Right for Apple, they were partners, and in fact, in the first two years, the most important guy was, you know, probably Wozniak. It wouldn't have been a company without him. Uh, but over time, um, as the company moved from, you know, one engineer's implementation of a product into a company, all the business expertise and sales and marketing and reality distortion field made Jobs the much more important. No, uh, the much more important player. And by the way, if you want to see what happens. Um, as somebody grows in their career, um, I don't know if any or all of you should be mandatory at every school. Uh, you should watch the 2005 Stanford commencement speech by Steve Jobs. Think of that as the benchmark of you know him articulating what he learned in 40 years of business career. Then watch Steve Wozniak talking after his appearance on Dancing with the Stars. Seriously, no joke. Here's 40 years of growth between two co-founders when in fact Wozniak was probably the most senior guy in the room 40 years earlier. And you could see who learned over time. It was actually quite instructive. I used to make my classes watch both for the last five years. Is that you started out as equals and then people grow up. And some people don't grow up. And, and you know, look at Paul Allen and Bill Gates. Um, look at some of the interviews that Allen had when he wrote his latest book saying how Bill Gates screwed me and, and listen to Bill Gates talk about business. 40 years. One of them grew up and the other was still the engineer. Um, not that the engineer is always the one who doesn't grow, but in, in these two cases, they were. Um, in fact, Alan was probably the more important guy, again, on day one. I don't know. Um, let me go back to your question, which is, um, it's kind of a, a trite phrase in the valley, but the heuristic kind of works. If you're doing a web startup, you need a hacker, a hustler, and a designer, right? Those are kind of the three things you tend to hear that ought to be the founding team. You know, a hacker to do the code, a hustler to kind of hustle out the business, and a designer who understands, you know, some basic UI elements. And for every business, you could kind of make those sets of heuristics. You know, in hardware, you probably need a hardware um, hacker, some kind of, you know, architect, and, and uh, you know, a, a great hustler as well. And, uh, and do I assume you're a hustler? Uh, that's probably an understatement. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was, uh, I think of startups uh, having three phases. You know, the search for the business model, the transition when you build the startup into something repeatable, and then the growth and execution phase when you go to the 100 and 200 million dollars. I was great at the search phase. I was actually not bad in the build, beginning build phase, and I hated, you know, everything. I, I always left when it was getting near 100 million dollars or even less. Um, and yeah, I was, I was good at it. I loved it. Um, I loved it because it was the search. Um, as I mentioned, I uh, got into numbers of businesses I knew nothing about. And um, 
one of the great things about Silicon Valley or entrepreneurship is you get paid to learn. I mean, look at that. You're, you know, VCs are paying you millions of dollars to go educated about, get educated about supercomputers. I mean, there was one company, we built a supercomputer and I became a domain expert in computational fluid dynamics, computational chemistry, finite element analysis, uh, and the seismic data processing and reservoir simulation. And I think one other market I can't remember. And I went around, first I had to understand the markets, and then I hired vertical marketing managers for each. And because it was very hard to find oil people in Silicon Valley, I ended up uh, acting as the guy who was doing reservoir simulation, seismic data processing. And I became um, facile enough that I could do a talk in, in, uh, in the application area. In fact, I, I still remember one of my proudest moments as a marketeer is I got invited down by Chevron when they had a La Habra Research Center in Southern California to do a brown bag lunch talk. And I gave the talk on, you know, modern methods of reservoir simulation to a bunch of PhDs. And while that was amusing enough, I was obviously panicked that someone was going to ask at least two questions deeper than I knew, which, you know, wouldn't be very hard. The research manager came up and said two things. One is, you know, thank God you came down. There's usually some dumb marketing guy they send down. <laughs> <laughs> and then he handed me his card and said, if you're ever interested in a job at Chevron Research, I'd be happy to go talk to you. That's I put call. that business card up on my wall for the 10 years I was still in business after that. It was, to me, that was kind of the high point of bullshit for, yeah. um, <laughs> for, for a marketeer. But, but uh, you know, the hustler part was not just selling. It was actually, for me, you really deeply had to understand your customer, which was an integral part of what I did. And to understand your customer, you had to understand their job. And to understand your job, so for example, I'll just give you exam uh, an example of what I mean about understanding your job. Not only did I talk to people in the oil business, I realized there was a whole education that I needed to have that I just didn't have time to get, so I rented a room, not a hotel room, uh, an apartment in Houston, and it turned out uh, Houston had a oil petroleum library, and I spent two and a half weeks reading the library, um, such that I could be conversant enough and kind of educate myself. But, you know, most of the stuff was Greek to me, but I absorbed enough by going from one shelf down to, down to the rest, picking out books that I thought I needed to, to learn. And then it became an execution problem. But first it was an education problem. Where else can you do this? Right? And where else could VCs pay for like a postdoc in every, um, every domain you, you had? Which is now, I'll tell you, so you think, think about those customers. My next company was the video game company. So I was going from selling to you know, people doing you know, computational fluid dynamics at Boeing and to 14 year olds buying video games. Okay, so let's continue following the story here. So you, uh, what happens with Epiphany? Do you sell it or do you take it public? Oh, uh, we, we took it public. And uh, so talk about learning. A couple of things is uh, we kind of understood that if we got this company right, it was going to be really big. Um, and it was probably going to be bigger than what our founder and I, uh, co-founder, actually, Ben Wegbright, my, my um, co-founder, and we had two other co-founders as well. We kind of realized that uh, we're probably going to want a um, CEO ultimately to take it public to do the roadshow. And um, we wanted to figure out how we don't get screwed. Um, and uh, my co-founder had been a uh, venture capitalist at uh, Hamburg and Quist. And I said, Ben, you know, we ought to worry about this. Is, you know, we need some parachute um, because we'll run it until it gets to a certain size. But I want to make sure, you know, we still end up worth all our stock. And ben, ben and I had a great relationship in that we both could say, I'll take care of it, and we knew each other would. Fast forward, we hire the COO of KPMG to run our company. Uh, you know, his secretarial staff was bigger than our entire company. Uh, but we were about to do $125 million in revenue that year. I mean, literally in three years, we went from zero to 100, and, actually four years, zero to $125 million hire the COO of KPMG, who comes into my office 90 days uh, after he was there. And I thought he was going to say something like this. He said, Steve, we have a problem. I need your help. And I kind of knew this was coming. He said, you know, the board's just kind of met. And I said, well, that's interesting, because I was on the board. We didn't and you meet. weren't invited to the <laughs> meeting. Invited. That's your first clue. You're your in first trouble. Clue. <laughs> no, but I knew it wasn't me, because he needed me. He said, you know, your co-founder, Ben, um, Ben needs to go. Really? Oh, that's interesting. 
yes, uh, we met as a board and we're going to give them 90 days, you know, vesting. I said, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, but we have a parachute uh, that says if we leave, uh, whether you fire us or we leave on purpose, we fully vest. And, you know, Roger laughed. He said, Steve, you just don't understand. We obviously, with, and Kleiner Perkins was the venture firm at the time, which is a big established firm. You know, Kleiner's lawyers have looked through the series documents and, you know, there is no parachute in there. And I said, uh, yes, that's because we put it in the state incorporation papers. And his face turned white. He said, what? <laughs> and, and, but he was so cool. This is why this guy was a great CEO. He said, I'll get back to you on this. <laughs> <laughs> and a week later, he says, Kleiner just fired their corporate counsel. Because mm. <laughs> <laughs> my partner, Ben, hid the parachute. But it wasn't hidden because we actually told them to review all the documents. And this is the last time in Silicon Valley that no one looked at the state incorporation papers. And to make a long story short, um, I, uh, I retired the day before the IPO became effective on purpose because I didn't want to be what's called a Section 16B officer. Took my stock, went home. And uh, it was at that company when I decided um, my children were seven and eight years old and I wanted to watch them grow up and uh, take the money off the table. And it had been a great 21 years and I learned a lot and I was going to do something else. And everybody who knew me in the Valley assumed there was Startup 9 or 10 or whatever. And what actually became Tesla actually started in my office. And I realized that the CTO of Tesla, J.B. Straubel, and I were working on um, actually the architecture, what became uh, 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 Tesla. And I decided this is going to be a 10-year play, and I don't have it in me in, anymore. I have no idea what I want to do. And I'll figure it out. And um, then I got invited to guest teach at UC Berkeley by Jerry Engel, um, who said, well, I hear you tell great stories. Um, and I said, well, I got something else in mind other than stories. And yeah, so, so talk about your first experience uh, as a professor teaching entrepreneurship, and I'm sure I know Jerry, and I'm sure he gave you all sorts of guidance and tips and so on, and, and probably set you off, but uh, uh, you quickly figured out you wanted to do something different. Yeah, it was, it was this funny intersection. As I said, I retired on purpose, not knowing what I wanted to do, but I was convinced that what the world really needed were my memoirs. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. Um, so it, in, in hindsight, it was obviously what I was actually acting out was what I needed was a catharsis to kind of purge through 21 years of war stories. But um, we were up skiing, and um, uh, my wife and the girls were out skiing, and I was now on page 80. And I was writing up everything I kind of learned from company to company. And at the end of each story, I would write something called the lessons learned. And the lessons learned were Here's what I learned from this, from this company or this activity or whatever. And about page 80, I still have the original document. I had two conclusions. One is I didn't even have to pay my children to read this thing. Um, and so the total available market would be two. Um, <laughs> but more importantly, that there was a pattern I was seeing in my own life. And then by then, I was sitting on a couple of public boards and a ton of private boards. And I realized that this pattern in my career was the same as the pattern I was seeing in all startups. And no one had ever written about it. No one. And I realized that this was pretty profound. Um, and that pattern was is that we were treating startups like they were smaller versions of large companies, and that they weren't. And the things we had all done to succeed was to ignore all the advice of how to write business plans and do income statements and whatever. And the successful moves were all to do something very different, which was to get out of the building and talk to customers. Yet this wasn't written anywhere in anything I had read. And that was the beginning of spending three years trying to ponder what's now just intuitively obvious about you know, customer development, lean startup, et cetera. But it was like no one had ever even articulated this before. So when I got um, approached by Jerry Engel to kind of first guest teach and then co-teach and then whatever, the deal was, uh, Jerry, I got a class in mind and a book in mind, and I want to teach this thing I'm calling customer development. And God bless him. Um, Jerry Engel uh, put me through a, a, a fairly uh, rigorous uh, process of, as I said, guest teaching, co-teaching. There was a guy named Jeff Timmons who was around at the time who actually taught how to teach entrepreneurship and how to teach cases and um, how to teach the rest and took a Timmons class. And um, um, I think got a, some pretty good training. And, what Berkeley got um, 
uh, in exchange was the first customer development class. And the book, Four Steps to the Epiphany, was actually my sets of class notes, which was I kept Xeroxing. And you know, the other part of the story is I had a company I had funded, which had cratered. Um, um, and the, the entrepreneur and uh, who had been my VP of engineering at one an earlier company had a young engineer he was taking with him as a co-founder. And they were starting this company called IMVU. And uh, before I would give him any money again, I said, listen, you screwed up the last one. Why don't you sit through my customer development class? And the founder was a guy named Will Harvey, but the young engineer was a kid named Eric Reese. Um, and Eric sat through my customer development class, kind of got it, um, and said, holy cow, we ought to couple this with agile engineering. And since I was their investor and sat on their board, Eric was probably the first guy on the planet who actually ever implemented Lean in IMVU. And we ran a series of experiments on the, on the board. And Eric's now kind of the Johnny Appleseed of this whole Lean startup. Mm -hmm. But that's how it yeah. kind of got started. And how, so that was, what, 10 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. So how have your ideas developed and progressed in the last 10 years? Um, you know, besides making it up as we go, um, you know, the, the first idea was around getting outside of the building. The first key idea was that there are no facts inside the building. Um, you need to get out. The second idea was, gee, this customer development process ought to be coupled with an agile engineering process. Um, and the third idea, which we now kind of consider these three pieces to be integral, and I actually think we, I learned them backwards, is that we needed some framework to kind of hold all this stuff and while I used to use the word business model, I didn't quite understand what a, how to draw one until I saw Alexander Osterwalder's work. And so now, we kind of believe there, there are three basic components that every entrepreneur needs to understand. The business model canvas, a customer development process to test all the hypotheses on the canvas, and an agile engineering process to actually build a product incrementally and iteratively. And this, to me, these three things are what I'll call the entrepreneurial API. Uh, just as most entrepreneurs worldwide speak English, you're going to have to speak these three things. Business model canvas, customer development, and, and agile engineering. And if you know these things, we now know something pretty profound. We now know in a room this size, absolutely will tell you, if we cut the room in half and had half of you writing business plans and the other half uh, following, you know, this lean methodology, that this group would fail less. Not succeed more, but would fail less. And that's pretty substantial. Are, are there certain kinds of businesses that this method is more appropriate for than others? You know, I first thought so. And then as, we, uh, as the National Science Foundation made me take the people, I thought it didn't work. Um, I first thought that this was just great for reducing customer and market risk, um, you know, web 2.0, you know, enterprise software, et cetera. But things that had predominantly uh, technical risk, like life sciences, you know, why would you put somebody through this process? And when I started teaching the National Science Foundation classes, they pointed out to me that one of the mistakes most of the life sciences companies make is thinking that all they need to do is do science for 10 years and then find out, oops, it was the wrong target. And that if you would have been out talking to pharma or, or potential uh, partners, you would have found out there might have been some intermediate targets or intermediate products or intermediate deals you could have uh, done. And so um, this kind of almost works for anything. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as a uh, professor, I'll go to a cocktail party and I get the same question over and over, and I'm sure you get it as well. Uh, you say you teach entrepreneurship, and the question you get is, well, can you really teach that? Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. your answer to that is yes, I assume. No, uh, actually no. not. Oh. <laughs> you know, because I was a practitioner for decades, not only did I get the question, my friends would laugh at me. You know, I go, Steve, you know, you were born entrepreneur. Um, you know, how can you teach it? And, and I realized this was, again, one of those interesting observations. We were stuck asking the wrong question. It's not whether you could teach entrepreneurship. It's who can you teach it to. That's the question. It's a big idea. You can only teach entrepreneurship to those who raise their hand and volunteer. You can't teach it to anybody else. If you desperately want to be an entrepreneur, I could teach you how to be an entrepreneur. I can't draft you. I could give you a survey class of here's entrepreneurship. And in fact, we know that there's an entire parallel to what this means. It's art school. We don't draft artists. You have to want to become a sculptor or a painter or a composer. 
We don't say you over here. Uh, can you uh, paint uh, Starry Night and you over here, uh, The Last Supper, and I'd like the Beethoven's Ninth over here, except you know in the lower key. Uh, you, you don't do that. Uh, those people are driven by passion and energy and excitement. Um, they want to create something. Entrepreneurship is an act of aggression and creation at the same time. Um, and unless you're driven to do this, the mistake now that it's popular is confusing it with some job. Um, almost every year uh, between Columbia and Berkeley and even uh, Stanford, I get students who've taken my class or need some other advice come up to me and say, you know, Professor Blank, I got a choice between jobs. Can you give me some advice? Sure, what's the choice? I got this great offer from McKinsey. And I go, wow, McKinsey, great company. Well, you know, what, could, what else could be a choice? Well, my roommates are, uh, asked me to join their startup. And I kind of look at them going, your choice is between McKinsey and a startup? Yeah, do you want to hear about it? I said, you've already decided. And they go, no, no, let me tell you about the startup. You've already decided. McKinsey is a job. A startup is a calling. If you're not called to the startup, um, it's going to be one of the most miserable things you're ever going to do. And why you want it to be driven by vision and passion and excitement is there will be days and weeks where you're depressed. Nothing is going wrong. Nothing is going right. Everything's going wrong. If, if you're not carried by that energy to take you through that, uh, you're not going to stick to it. And this is a long-term ground game. Uh, it's not a job. Um, and again, the mistake we've made is popularized it that, oh yes, you just kind of joined some early stage venture. Okay. Is that? I, yeah, I'm going to open it up. Well, now I have a new answer when I get asked yeah. that question. At, at, it's uh, only to Park. those who volunteer. I, uh, which, by the way, Murray, it, it explains why at least when I teach the Lean Launchpad class, you've got to apply to get in. And, and if you don't get in, you've got to be angry. Um, and if you're not angry, uh, then you shouldn't have gotten in in the first place. But, and, and no, I'm, at Stanford, I won't tell you I do, Murray won't let me do it here. I just kind of do this as a test sometimes. I take the team I think uh, really wants to get in, and I turn them down, and I'll see if they'll chase me to the parking lot. Almost every time. Almost every time. And then I let them in. Um, <laughs> kind of cruel. Uh, I'm going I'm to open it up to questions in a minute, but I want to ask one last question. Uh -huh. So uh, Economist uh, newspaper or magazine, uh, the cover story a week or so ago was, has the ideas machine broken down? Uh, and they look at sort of uh, you know, GDP growth and so on, and, and they say, you know, this period of internet boom and uh, computer technology hasn't resulted in the kind of growth we want to see. So do you, do you have an opinion about that? And then it's a double-barreled question. Uh, where do you think the big areas of opportunity are today? Well, let me answer the, the first, the last one first. You know, if I knew how to answer that, I'd be running a hedge fund, not be sitting here. I mean, you know, the, the big opportunities are, you know, the ones that haven't made the news yet. Um, they're the ones that are considered crazy ideas by the people in the back of the room. If you're already reading about big data or something else, it's way too late to uh, be starting those companies because there's 25 of them already out there. I mean, it doesn't mean you shouldn't. It just means uh, if you have the idea that everybody thinks is the stupidest idea in the world, um, you might be the uh, in the right spot. Um, what were the other questions? Um, uh, uh, so has the idea machine broken down? No. And, uh, uh, and why don't we see sort of the rates of GDP growth that we would expect with all of the sort of computer internet revolution? Well, um, you know, they certainly have not broken down, but the problem is, um, you know, the venture business. So we talk about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship continuously. We need to remember that it's a two-party system, meaning uh, entrepreneurship as a cluster in a business only works when the equally crazy entrepreneurs are matched by equally crazy uh, financiers. Risk capital is not a rational business. I mean, we're, what other financial business uh, could you have that over 90% of your investments fail? I guess the housing market, that probably comes to mind. But, um, but besides that one, you know, I mean, think about it. You tell your investors that 90% of the deals I'm going to invest in are going to fail. Wow, that's one heck of a financial asset class. Um, and by the way, that's the distinction of why Silicon Valley beat out Boston in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, when I came out to Silicon Valley, it wasn't clear that it was going to be Silicon Valley or Boston. They all have the same pedigree, you know, military industrial uh, um, uh, investment uh, based around the world-class research university. Um, but it was actually the venture capitalists taking 
incredible more risk than Boston. Boston VCs ended up looking like bankers, almost indistinguishable, where uh, Silicon Valley VCs looked like pirates. Um, and, and that culture, that pirate culture, was not only in the entrepreneurs, that pirate culture was in the rapacious um, um, venture capitalists. And that's what kind of made that culture. What we're seeing, though, in the, I think in the last couple of years, was a giant sucking sound of social media kind of driving money out of, I mean, I know venture firms who are shutting down their life sciences practice so they could put the next, you know, couple hundred million bucks in more social media startups. The, the interesting, so is that a good thing? No, it's a terrible thing. Um, you know, on a, on a national level, and now that I got involved with, uh, tangentially with the National Science Foundation, we have, for the last 70 years, built an enormously um, effective and productive national science policy. We invest $150 billion a year, about, in basic applied uh, uh, R&D through you know, NIH, NSF, to DOD, ARPA, et cetera. Um, and, and that flows through, you know, about uh, 35 billion of it goes directly to, to universities to fund the 55 billion dollars in R&D that universities spend, research universities spend. Uh, yet, what industries we decide to fund, what new industries, it's the 30 billion dollars of venture capital that actually is a substitute for the fact that the U.S. doesn't have a national industrial policy. We've kind of let it default to VCs. And then you go, well, how are they investing? Well, they're fad driven. Th that is, there isn't anybody saying, well, perhaps we ought to incent these VCs to invest in things like, you know, graphene or new materials or, you know, solar or whatever. But instead, you know, the government's policy has actually did, have been the, uh, trying to be the picker of winners and losers themselves and, and individual corporate um, investments. And uh, that's never a winning policy, at least, um, um, when you play a game of gotcha in the government, because 90% of those individual investments are going to fail. So the answer is, uh, I'm just a little concerned that in the US, we don't even have a national industrial policy, and it's being based on the whims of uh, where VCs want to go. Historically, it was fine when we didn't have a global competitor in manufacturing, and uh, now we do. And mm -hmm. China, China. Inc. It does a much better job than we do in figuring out where to put these investments. And while we're on sort of the political sphere, uh, sort of all the partisanship in Washington and the fiscal cliff, and uh, how do you think that is affecting the sort of world of entrepreneurship? Yeah, so, so there's a, you know, two things, and, and I'll start with, um, this is way above my pay grade, but I've never seen a question I didn't like. So I'll, I'll try it anyway. Um, um, you know, uh, I think it's interesting to separate out the gamesmanship of the cliff which I just believe is gamesmanship. I mean, somebody's going to back down. Um, and, and more than likely, we could guess who. Um, but, but the second piece of it is more fundamental. There is just an increasing rate of entitlements kind of being engineered into the national budget. And eventually, something has to give. And it's really kind of tough uh, because uh, you know, there is this sense that this country is built on social justice and built on doing the right thing. But eventually, you run out of money for everything else. Um, this country was also built on the, our investments in science and defense and things other than a social safety net. And it, it's a intractable math problem that we've not come to grips with. We've kind of said, we want everything, and we'll worry about the bill later. Well, the bill's going to come due. And I don't hear either party actually having a serious conversation about what is it the country wants to do do we want to, in fact, stop investing in science and defense and whatever and have an infinite safety net because of social, social justice? Or do we want to say, no, there's a limit on how much we're going to invest in that because we want to do these other things. And we seem to have chosen, no, we want to do everything. And let's fight about that. And, and it sounds like you would, uh, you would look forward to a government that was more proactive in terms of, of industrial policy and setting a, a direction for uh, sort of reviving the economy and investment. Sure, I mean, you know, un unless the economy grows at an accelerated rate, uh, you know, it used to be we do war spending, and in, in wartime we have these huge deficits, and then, you know, the war would be over, we'd stop that spending, and then, you know, uh, we could afford to, you know, the economy would grow again. That growth isn't happening, and those entitlements keep growing, yet we still want to do all these other things. And, and my point is, we haven't had that discussion as a national discussion. 
what we've had are two parties jumping to a series of conclusions about solutions without having, I think, the, I mean, and, and so, you know, to me, it's, a, it's just kind of amazing when people start using pejoratives in conversations and name calling and, and trigger words, you've already lost the conversation, right? The, you know, on either party, what you really want to have, again, to me is a dispassionate discussion of there's a finite pile of money. We can either figure out how to grow the economy to make it a bigger pile of money, okay, and we want to figure out what do we want the country to be investing in and what's important. And um, I'm not sure we've had that conversation. Yeah. Okay, let's so open it up to questions. I'm closing on a note of nothing, something I know nothing about. But. <laughs> This lady uh, in the back here. Not well. Uh, <laughs> you're 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 an educator right now, and there's sort of a big, uh, uh, I guess, push with respect to ed tech and things like Udemy and General Assembly, etc. What are your thoughts on that? And um, in terms of Ivy League schools, etc., do you think that that there's sort of a deferential thought process with respect to education and technology? Uh, can you give me your thoughts? Yeah, it's a huge fat, um, and, and uh, I think some interesting stuff will come out of it. Full disclosure, I'm an investor in Udacity, um, all the, uh, which is one of those online um, uh, platforms. Also, full disclosure, I put all my lectures on Udacity for free, um, and in the last four months, I got 70,000 students taking the class. Um, so, you know, for the first time, a professor could have reach in a way. Uh, that, than you never could have before. And what's really interesting, I think, out of these platforms are the unintended consequences. So while I have students taking the class, what I never expected is other professors in countries I can't even pronounce are using the lectures as part of a flipped classroom. That is, they're using the lecture, because I open sourced my syllabus and my slides, they make the students watch my lectures, and now they're having discussion on the lectures in the class and so the, the lectures are homework, but they've now adopted it by default. And so very quickly, it's becoming a, a de facto entrepreneurship course for other education, educators, which was not its intent at all, though I don't mind. Um, so I think um, uh, online education is going to have a, a lot of effect. It's not going to affect the Columbia's or Stanford's as profoundly as going to affect the community colleges and state colleges. Uh, you've got a Columbia and Stanford and Berkeley for reasons that are uh, it's, you're, you're there for the faculty and for the network, uh, where in other uh, places you're there for a different reason. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Another question? Right here? Uh, you, had, you started eight businesses over 20 years. How old were you when you started your first one? And what, from that, what correlation do you make between the success of the startup and one's age? Uh, <laughs> Let's see, I got out of the military, I must have been 22, 23, so I guess then. Um, you know, factor in six months for getting thrown out again um, from school. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, there's two kind of axes to uh, age. W one is when you're in your 20s, I characterize myself and 20 year olds as too dumb to know it can't be done. Um, and, and, you know, enough energy to run around trying to prove it can be. And then the when you're older, you just have a lot more wisdom, and the thing you've got to be careful about is, and you're smarter about how you spend the limited energy you have, um, and you just got to be careful of uh, not falling victim to, I know too much. Um, but I've never seen age, so for example, um, as I mentioned, I teach or taught the first National Science Foundation classes. The average age of the principal investigator in the classes was 52 years old, and the big question for the NSF team is could we make them, you know, move as fast as kids in their 20s in hoodies and flip flops? And the answer was hell yeah. Um, they were just smarter about the moves they made, but um, because we selected people who raised their hand, um, they already selected yes, we want to learn how to do this. So, but but, sh but should we be encouraging uh, young people to start businesses or to go and get experience and then start later once they uh, yeah, have learned lessons on others? See, I just, uh, I, I go back, Murray, to those are the wrong questions. I don't think we want to encourage any of them. Um, I, I, encouraging people is the wrong thing to do about entrepreneurship. I think we want them to know that it's possible. Uh, but I think there needs to be a barrier that says, no, no, we're going to give you paint, we're going to give you sculpture material, we're going to offer art classes, but we're not going to encourage you to be artists. You need to be encourage your, yourself to be artists. And with that, I, I think a natural form 
between those that are young and those that are older with wisdom? They naturally seem to kind of sure. collect so, together. And so, so there's something in the valley called the uh, pay it forward culture. Any of you hear about this at all? Uh, pay it forward, some of you have. Pay it forward culture uh, basically says that when you're old, successful, or retired, or even failed, retired, you owe it uh, to the younger generation to spend time mentoring and consulting with them. And it's a hidden part of the Valley's culture. And when I explain this to foreign visitors, they kind of freak out. Well, what do you get for it? And do you get stock, or they hand you, you know, money or equity, or you sit on advisory boards? Maybe, but that's not why you do it. There's a social obligation uh, to do this. The most famous picture of this is a long-haired kid before he started his first company, sitting at the dinner table with Robert Noyce, who was the chairman of Intel. Back then, Intel was kind of the combination of Google, Microsoft, and Facebook all rolled into one. He had just found his name in the phone book. He called him up and said, you know, I need some advice. And the guy who was in his 50s found this kid so amusing, you know, he mentored him for, you know, until the old guy died in, in, in his 60s. And the photo is of Steve Jobs before he started Apple was his mentor was Robert Noyce. And while Jobs never made this public, Jobs was mentoring Zuckerberg and the Google Boys, et cetera, were all you know, people that Jobs mentored. And the whole valley was full of um, others who do this. And it's one of the things why I did it, is others had done it to me. And I kind of felt as um, my mentors were Gordon Bell and um, um, Ben Wegbright and a couple others. And they didn't ask for anything. They just thought I was either bizarre enough or interesting enough or amusing enough or all combination that, by the way, how you end up getting mentors is you actually are giving something back to them you don't realize. You're making them smarter implicitly because you know something and you're passionate about a new area that now all of a sudden they're learning about is they're giving you the pattern recognition skills and wisdom to kind of understand what it is you're learning. And uh, that's why I guess I was mentored. And those uh, unconsciously, that's why I pick a certain set of students to mentors, I get smarter every time I'm with them, but I share kind of my overlay of here's what it means. Does that make sense? Um, and so for New York, I would suggest uh, this is a culture that could, should be shamed into starting. You know, there's a huge number of potential mentors in New York City. I mean, it's talking about a concentration of wisdom, but it doesn't seem to, everybody seems to want something from it. And it has to be a, I found it works great when you just go in with no expectation. Does that make sense? This right. gentleman over here. Yes. Yep. Um, based on your experiences, how do you? I mean, how did you search or find your co-founders? How did you find your co-founders? You know, I wish I could tell you it was a um, rational process. Um, it was people I worked with where uh, um, I had gained confidence in their skills, and they had gained confidence in mine. Um, and to me, the, uh, I have to tell you, this is just my data points. Not, I'm not sure I could extrapolate. Um, but the biggest issue for me for co-founders was skill set was even secondary, but absolute 100% trust um, in competence and the fact that you could turn your back. You would give them your children and your wife and your bank account and, and, and know you were safe. Um, because uh, you know, a startup is one of the most stressful things. It's truly like being in war. Um, you are in the foxhole, and stuff is exploding around you. And the last thing you want to um, have to second guess is whether somebody is, you know, still standing next to you when the stuff hits the fan, um, or whether they're going to back out or whatever. Which is why about a third of startups collapse before even they get funding. And that's a good thing, by the way. Team formation is absolutely essential and critical. And if you have any second guesses about a co-founder, um, you already are on the right track. Don't do it. Don't do it with those people. Um, you know, the, one of the famous Silicon Valley stories is Epiphany actually had five co-founders. And there was a, a, a woman who I loved dearly who said, Steve, I just don't want to work for you. And I said, I don't care. Work for, you know, Ben over there. And Ben said, Steve, you know, we're partners. That's not, not the way it's going to work. And she said, well, I can't do this. And so when we had the S1 document, my co-founder sent her a copy of the Red Herring. And she got to see that she was the fifth beetle. And, you know, those are decisions that people make. But, um, um, you know, he was much smarter than I was. I just would have went with it. And Ben said, you know, that's not how we're going to start the company. Does that make sense? Um, um, you mentioned this earlier when you uh, 
um, you were talking about the fab driven nature of VCs. Um, but if you if you had a if you had to, if you could comment on which fads you think are right and wrong um, for for VCs, I should preface this by saying I'm a life scientist and my sister is a solar engineer. So you hinted at both of those. I'm wondering if you think those are fads that um, are anti-fads rather. Well, I, I think um, you know in clean tech, uh, they were surprised to Silicon Valley as that became a fad until they discovered that these weren't startups. These were like industrial concerns that took you know, uh, time scales that, you know, you built manufacturing plants and industries, they weren't software, even microprocessor businesses that you could see some results in two to three years. It was gonna take a decade or two. And Silicon Valley historically, except for life sciences, was not used to investing in things that took a decade or two to see results. Um, we tended to be impatient. And what I see with the life sciences now is kind of Know, and again, I'm not an expert, but I do have a bunch of friends who used to be in that business that funds that actually are not life sciences specific but had multiple domains in them were shutting down their life sciences groups because they said, why should we wait 10 years to see whether our investment is you know, going to return a billion dollars? Look at Instagram. We could be investing in 10 possible Instagrams and, and you know, find out within three years. Um, so, you know... I, yeah, I believe we ought to be investing in these, but um, other people are making other decisions. Am I, did I answer your question or not? Yeah, I think so maybe it's not the role of the VC, though. Is it, is it something that the government, in your mind, should be... So, so this is where I come back to, you know, we've kind of, as I said, we've never hesitated. We must have put a, more than a trillion dollars into our national science policy in the last just decade or two. But, you know, the, the political third rail that we can't talk about in the U.S., like bizarre is national industrial policy where we say that's all private capital. Well, private capital doesn't always invest in what's good for the country. It invests, as we've now seen, you know, go try to find some manufacturing in New York anymore. It, it, it invests in what's the most efficient. Um, but we've never changed either tax policy or, or strategy to incent what's great for the country. What we has, what we've had and have, in my opinion, is what's great for the bottom line which is not necessarily what's great for the country. Used to be, um, but now we have other global competitors, i.e. China, uh, where, you know, like we're now making their economy a lot stronger. And, you know, they're, Apple created a million jobs. Unfortunately, they're not in this country. Um, you know, no one disses Apple. Gee, you know, it would take about an hour and a half of the president beating them with a stick uh, to kind of change the political culture in this country if we decided to do that. Um, I'm not sure those are the jobs we want, et cetera, but I think it's a conversation. I'm just kind of confused why we don't have it. CEOs in the last, I'll just give you the other part of the riff. CEOs in the last decade have turned into the, uh, uh, the chief execution officer, not the chief, right? I mean, if you really think about the role of the CEO in most Fortune 1000 companies is how do I maximize short-term results for investors? That's not necessarily good to the long-term life cycle of the corporation, let alone the long-term life cycle of the American economy. But that's, in fact, where we've let the economics drive it rather than actually articulating a policy which we could, in fact, steer with tax policy, incentives, et cetera. I happen to believe that the last way to steer it is with government direct investment in companies, except for exceptional things. But I think, you know, we've used tax policy and other things to incent lots of other stuff. And by the way, when you do this, you have all kinds of unintended consequences and people gaming the system, et cetera. But um, I'm just not happy with it where it's headed, to be honest. I'm going to take two more questions. Well, and the I haven't question. done this side of the room, so way in the back. Uh, if you were entering a new industry with the intent of disrupting it and seeking out clients, how would you go about identifying people who were open to seeing their industry, industry disrupted? <laughs> well, you know, no one wants to face death. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, I, you had me to, until the last part of it. Who asked the question? I did. Um, without giving you a huge amount of background, it would take up a lot of time. Uh, let's say you were entering a very established industry that was not very receptive to change. Um, and you were probably going to put some people out of work, change where they did a lot of things, uh, and you needed to find people who were interested in 
progress. How would you go about it? So are you talking about finding customers who want it? Essentially, yes. Right, because you know, it is existing customer, existing companies uh, tend to act like antibodies when you tell them they're, you're going to put them out of business, <laughs> right? So, so if you're talking about finding customers, that's you know relatively easy, and you're looking for people who, in fact, either want competitive advantage or want new ease of use, or in fact, couldn't even envision uh, what you were talking about until you show up with it. Um, you know, Apple was probably the best disruptor in the last decade and probably the best example of a 21st century disruptor, they would disrupt their own markets, which was actually kind of cool. Steve Jobs personally put three businesses, you know, in peril, right? He put the music business, the phone business, and the, um, there's one other I'm missing, but, um, um, the PC business with the tablets, thank you. Um, these were his own businesses, so he managed to disrupt them. But he didn't say, I'm gonna disrupt the business, he just said there was a different business model and he was focused on the customers and the end product. Does that make sense or not? I'm happy to t talk about it. And you don't go in saying, you know, uh, which company is going to love me for disrupting this. What, what you go in saying, you know, I have a vision of something that's much better that's not been envisioned by the incumbents. Um, and that's what I call a new market. And in a new market, you don't do the same type of customer discovery you do in an existing market. Existing market, you could go out and ask, customers, what is the basis of competition? They could actually tell you it's speed, it's something else. They could tell you who the competitors are. They could even name the market. Now you try to go do that in a new market that you envision. Go ask people who, what features they want, and then you get a kind of a response like Jobs is, you know, I can't go ask somebody about a product I haven't invented, but you can go figure out what's the day in the life look like before and after. That is, what fundamental change am I going to bring to this that people can't even envision if this happens. Does that make sense? So right. Steve, Steve is disrupting the education, entrepreneurship education <laughs> business, and we still invite him here. So, uh. Actually, okay, I, who I, has I, one I, last, I, I have to tell you, um, um, you've just said something interesting, and, and it was about the second or third time I've heard this. Uh, what you're watching is what happens when a type A entrepreneur hits education. Um, you know, I, um, there was something I, I read or watched a long time ago, it was again a Steve Jobs quote, about, um, you know, we're born and people tell us that the walls around us are kind of the walls around us and that these are the limits on what we do and what you learn is what you learn and those are the facts and you kind of live your life and try not to bounce into the walls. And my whole career has been, you know, screw that. It's a lot more fun to kind of push the, push the boundaries and figure out whether these walls are actually true. And in fact, if you're an entrepreneur and if you're a disruptor, that's your job as well. Um, and so, you know, entrepreneurship for 100 years has had a status quo. And, you know, entrepreneur education for the last decade or two has had, here's what you do and here's the curriculum and you're pushing the boundaries. And uh, I am too. And uh, I've just never been afraid to do that because I always thought it's a lot more interesting to, you know, be a pirate. What's the phrase? Be a pirate than join the Navy. Um, and, and so we're, we're seeing that with entrepreneurial education. Um, we're seeing not just incremental changes, we're seeing some massive changes right now. And um, they seem to be heading us in the right direction. So, sorry, last question. Last question, it's gotta be a great question. Do you have a great question? Yes, sir, I do. Yeah. Okay, go for it. <laughs> to be an entrepreneur, you at least have to be confident, right? Uh, something I really wanna know. I uh, just wanna backpedal on, on, on a comment that you said earlier. Uh, you mentioned that you're a mentor to several of your students. Yeah. My question to you is, is what attributes do you look for uh, for someone who just has an idea? What, what motivates you to listen to that idea, to want to be a mentor for that, that individual? That's a great question to end the, the discussion with. If you look at sort of some raw talent, what are the criteria that say, yes, I'm going to work with that person? Yeah, actually, it's not about the idea. It's about the, kind of the sum of, you know, do I get smart? I mean, I'm just telling you personally for me, it's everybody has an idea. You know, if you're an entrepreneur, my dog probably has ideas, and I don't even have a dog. Um, but but it, it, it's, it's more about the, um, you know, are you, you know, it's the characteristics of a great entrepreneur. Are you curious? Uh, th therefore, can we talk about anything? Are you tenacious? You know, do you have some great stories about how you just got thrown out of X trying to make Y happen? Or, you know, are you relentless? Um, 
and you know, or are you telling me stories about, or you know, do you keep calling me until I finally tell you I'm going to call the police <laughs> unless you stop calling, um, because I'm not interested in your stories or you don't have any. Um, and so it's kind of the sum of men are you, you know, interesting and a nice person. Um, and and so you know, I must have taught a couple thousand students by now, and you know, I don't mentor hundreds, but I mentor people who kind of fit in that bucket is, and, and to be honest, um, it's less so what's their hot idea, which those are the ones that I actually run away from, is let me pitch you my idea. And when it's such a uh, narrow focus on that, that's just not my shtick. I mean, that's great for early stage VCs, and I'm not trying to fund you. I'm just trying to um, learn, actually, now that I know what it is, I'm trying to learn something back. Does that answer your question? Well, If someone genuinely wanted you to be a mentor, not yeah. a, not the, a, not the, a, you don't apply for the job. You don't apply, you don't apply to be a mentee. If you're selected. It's unfortunately who, so, so I'm telling you my my data point is just one data point. Um, mine is you can't apply for the job. Uh, you know, and it, and the most embarrassing ones are the ones who say, you know, I want you to be my mentor. It doesn't work that way for me. Uh, might for others. I mean, I don't run this as a business. I just run it for what do I get out of it versus what can I give you back? And for me, the, the impedance match is, is this a going to be a broad discussion over a number of years? Because I don't want to hear your current idea. I mean, I'll hear it, but you know, if we're going to have a relationship, it's going to be, I'm going to hear about 40 ideas from you. And by the way, the sad thing, and it's very bittersweet, um, eventually, if you're somebody who's being mentored, you eventually grow past your mentors. It's, a, it's like your kids growing up or you growing up, and then eventually you find yourself as the mentors. And you look around and you go, whoa, how did that happen? <laughs> whoa, well, as I said, I, I, and it only happens somewhere between your mid-20s and maybe mid-30s, is it's that decade when that relationship happens. Um, and you're either called and it happens and not. And, and I just wanted to be clear, it's not, a, and I, I would say it's probably for most mentors, it's not about you pitching your current idea is how you end up with that relationship. It's about, you know, you are kind of interesting in other areas. And, you know, uh, as, I, as I think I implied, I was always interested in a bunch of other stuff and I could have a conversation about multiple subjects and I think that's what interested the people who mentored me was, you know, I could talk about computer architecture at the same time I could talk about you know, Renaissance art, 19th century Impressionism, and New York 18th century architecture. Um, and I was just made some fun conversations rather than, why don't you look at my deck? And th that's, a, that's a VC pitch. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, but that's just my data point. I'm not telling you that's, and it might not be what you want as a mentee, but I think you should differentiate. I want somebody to listen to my pitch versus I want to have a re relationship that lasts multiple years, almost a decade that we will mutually get smarter about. And that exists, and if you're lucky, you will have multiple mentors in, in that time. So um, with that, I wanna thank you all for sitting through me kind of rambling and Murray asking some great questions.